let's work through an example. I want to I want to take the ideas that we really haven't spoken about yet, which I we haven't really talked about what are the different CSS properties that you can use and how do they work and what does it look like in practice to do a lot of this stuff? We haven't seen examples. So I want to do a full example. And here's my goal. I want to take this article as an inspiration from The New Yorker. And I really love the layout of it. So if you look at this page, they've got lots of interesting things happening with fonts, font sizes, font choices, the, the color um, images text, really interesting, just, just a really beautifully done website. And I'm going to focus on all of this. I'm going to, I'm not going to worry about the header and the footer and all of that, because that's the kind of thing that we can focus on when we do layout. Instead, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this. And so what I've done is I've made a not identical, but a, a fairly similar version of it in terms of the text. Um, I've used different titles and different names and so on. And you'll notice that I've also inserted a bunch of boilerplate text. So whenever you're doing a design, uh, a lot of designers will use, web developers will use lorem ipsum, and they'll have basically a bunch of text that is not something that you're going to try and read. So when you look at this, your eye, unless you can read Latin, your eye isn't going to go and say, oh, I'm going to start reading this, but you, your eye also sees text. So when you're trying to design something before you have all of the content for a website, this is a classic thing when you're doing web design, you're working with a client or you're working on a project and you don't actually have the content yet. It's it's tricky because how do you how do you build something? So here we've got, I've got 10 paragraphs of lorem ipsum generated and I use the generator to just generate a bunch of of text, copied and pasted it, made some paragraph. So I've got a I've got a basic HTML document here on the right, and this is this is what we're going to be working through. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna uh, start mocking it up and start taking different pieces of this and seeing seeing how far we can go. Okay. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to load in some styles. So I've got an empty style sheet here that's ready to go, styles.css, and I need to put it inside this page. So remember, the ways that we said you can load uh, a web page or styles into a web page, you could do an embedded style attribute. So I could put a style in here and then I could fill it up with styles. But we said that it's better to use an external document because it can cache it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a link and my link needs to have three things. I have to say the relationship of this link to the uh, document that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be producing here, and that is, it's a style sheet. And let me just switch back here. And what else do I need to do? I have to say the href is equal to styles.css to the file that I'm gonna be working with. It's relative to the current page, so I could have said dot slash if I wanted to. Uh, but I'm just going to say uh, styles.css and the type of this is equal to text CSS. And I'll close this down and I'll save it. And I mean, we'll know if it works. Let, let's just put something on here. So let's say that we want our body background color to be blue. If I save this, yeah, you get a nice ugly blue background color and it's working. So it's loading styles so I can save this and I have an empty I have an empty page here now. So I'm ready to go. Okay, so the first thing we should do is we should probably try and do these two titles. So the first one at the top here, the sporting scene, I've changed it to the styling scene and I've done it as an H2 and then the big one here is um, the H1 and it's the main the main title. So the top one needs to be red or something close to red. So in our in our um, in our page, let's let's do the same thing too. So what I want to do is I want to write a selector for this right here. So one thing I can do is I could use I well the simplest thing I could do is I could say h2 and I could say color red like that. And that that works. 
But because my H2 is inside of my header block, another thing I could do is I could give a little more context than I could say that I want to make this for, I want to, inside the header there's an H2 and I want to specifically target that H2. And what that's going to allow me to do is separate out how the H2s in other parts of my document are going to work. So they aren't necessarily going to be affected when I save this. Uh, what have I done wrong? Header H2 and there we go. It's styling it. Okay. So now I need to figure out this font. Now I've I'm going to try not to look at the CSS for this page too much, but I did cheat a little bit. Hopefully you'll, you'll forgive me. I wanted to figure out what fonts they were using and the browser can actually tell you this is exactly the font that they're using. But I was interested to see how close I could get using fonts that I have available to me. So it turns out that they're using this font here um, or a version of it. The, the New Yorker has their own version of it, I think, but it looks like this. Like you can see the B here, uh, the capital B, and you can see the capital B here. It's pretty similar. So this is uh, the Irvin heading font. And it says, if you wanna use this font, you can do it a couple of ways. You can either use a link or you can import it into your style sheet using an import. So I'm actually gonna do it as an import just because uh, we haven't done that yet. So I'm gonna grab this right here and I'm gonna, at the top of my file, I'm gonna put in a comment and I'm gonna say, uh, Irvin heading titles font. And I'm gonna paste that in like so, and I'll save it. And if we, if we just take a look at this file, again, you notice what they're doing? They're doing a protocolless URL so that they don't have to worry about HTTP versus HTTPS. If I load this into my browser, you can see what this thing is actually doing. So what it's doing is it's defining a font face and it's giving it a name of Irvin and then it defines a whole bunch of different source files in all different formats. So what we should see is if I were to inspect this page and look in the network tab, when I reload this, um, you can see it's loading my style sheet. Nothing's using this font yet, so I don't think it's downloading any of the, you know, it hasn't decided to download them yet. So we should go ahead and, and actually turn on um, this font for our two headings. So if you look at this, I've got two headings that need to use it, H2 and H1, they're both inside of a header. So why don't we, why don't we do that? Why don't we say header H1 and header H2? And you notice that I'm separating them with a comma. So the first space says this H1 is contained within a header. And the second one says this H2 is contained within a header. And then I have a comma. And sometimes people will put them on a different line if you want to separate them out like that to make it easier to read. And what we can say is that the font family that we want to use is Irvin, like so. And if for some reason Irvin isn't available, let's use whatever the available serif font is, like so. And you can see already it looks, looks way different, okay? So here's what the New Yorker article looks like, here's what ours looks like. So the first thing I notice is that the size of this, what we have is wrong, it's, ours is way too big. So we, I'm gonna put in a, um, actually I can do it down here. I've already got a, a rule started. So I've said, I want this to be red and I want the font size, I want the font size to be smaller than it is. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna specify my font sizes, not using pixels, but one of the things that the notes talk about today is using um, the EM font size. I just wanted to talk for a second about what EM means. So when you're talking about uh, an EM or an M unit, what you're saying is I want to go based on the size of the letter M. And an EM unit is a relative unit to the parent of the element that you're in. So if I said, for example, that I want this to be one EM, what that means is I want it to be like 100% or one whole M unit of the font. So in this case, it's going to look 
well, if I save this, it's going to look like this. So it's um, typically that's going to be 16 pixels. Uh, let's drop it down. So let's say, let's make it a fraction of 1 EM. And let's say, I don't know, like 0 0.8, 0 0.8 EM. And that looks, that looks closer. That's pretty, pretty good. The nice thing about working with these EM sizes is if I, if I increase my zoom, you'll notice that everything scales relatively. So it's making everything bigger, but it's keeping the proportions of everything correct when I'm going to do this. All right, let's play with the header H1. And so the header H1 needs um, a bigger font size. So I don't know, 2, 2 EM? No, not big enough. It needs to be bigger than that. 2.4 EM? How about that? I'm just going to break this page out for a second so we can see them beside each other. Pretty, pretty close without having a ruler or something. I'd say they're, they're getting close. I think let's um, play with the font weight and thin it out a little bit. You can see, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's good enough for me at least for what I want to do right now. Okay. So what else do we have going on here? Now, another thing that I notice is that there's a lot of space. There's there's quite a bit of margin here, and we're mostly focusing on margin next week. But I want to do a little bit with it right now. My 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 page is too tight to the left hand edge. So what I want to do is I want to add this extra space here. So I'm gonna just put it on. I'm gonna put it on a parent element. So if you look at all this content, all of this content is inside of the body. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the body so that it pushes everything else in internally. So up here at the very top, I'm going to say that the body needs to have a margin of, I don't know, 40 pixels maybe. And it now pushes everything in on all the sides. So you can see that it's just made everything. How does that look when you go back and forth between them? Pretty close. Now, another thing that I notice that's happening is my content is going really wide. And this one is getting cropped off right about here. You can see there's a line where it just stops. So that's probably like, I don't know, 800, 900 pixels. So why don't we specify that we want the header. Actually, it's the the header. If we look at our content, we've got header and main. So the main content here is also being um, cut. So let's say that we want the header, comma, and the main to both, whoops. We would like them both to be to have a maximum width of say, I don't know, 800 pixels. That's not enough, that's too much. 700 pixels. Even, even less maybe. something like that. We can play with it. Something right about here. 
but we don't want it to get any wider than that. So the page itself, the page itself can get wider. That's fine, but we want that content to not get any wider than any wider than this. So let's come back to it, but something, I don't know if that's right, 600 maybe for now. Okay, so what else do we need to deal with? We need to deal with how this text here looks. So you notice that the font has changed. So now we've got another font, and this is a uh, sans serif font. And again, so we have a we have a serif font for the titles and the text, and then for a bunch of things in the page like this. And I noticed down here for this, we've got sans serif, which is sort of um, metadata or citations or who it's about, who, sorry, who it's by, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's let's do that. So in our in our header, we have a paragraph element. Let's change the let's change the way that this looks and we need to we need to change the font now I, I went searching to try and find some fonts that look similar to these things and I want to show you how to use Google web fonts so I'm going to pick fonts from Google web fonts and these you can use these in any website that you want to create and they're hosted on Google's CDN so they're really nice to use um, highly optimized and they have lots and lots of beautiful fonts that you can use and you can come here and if you're trying to look for something um, you know author you could see how it would look in various fonts you can limit it to you know if you're only interested in sans serif fonts for example you could eliminate the other fonts and you can find the fonts that you like and click through them so i found two that i think would look good Two that I think would be good to use. So as a, a sans serif font, I think uh, this is a nice one. So Reem Kufi. And another one that I thought was nice for later on with some other things that we have to do um, for the body text, I thought that Garamond looked looked pretty close to what, um, what was being used in the page. So I have these two fonts here. And the way that the Google Web Fonts work, if you select a font, so I could select multiple multiple fonts what they do is they give you an embeddable way to use this so you can either do it as a link or you can do it as a um, as an import so you can pick which way you want to do it so let's do it i'll just do this as an import as well so up at the top here i'm going to import these two fonts into mine and i've got I've got Garamond and Reem Kufi. They've both been, they've both been included. I'm going to save that so that I can go back and I can change some more about my text. So what I want to do is in my header, I want to update this so that it changes the font family to use this Reem Kufi font. If that font isn't avail isn't available, I want to use a sans serif font to to show this. So here we've got, you can see the two of them here. Um, let's do a little bit more work. Who it's by and then this. So this needs to go on a new line. So I'm going to put a break in here like so. And whenever you see yourself, uh, in this case I've got a I've got a, a date. So I'm gonna wrap my date in a time element so that you can format your time, your date and time to look how you want, you know, in the page. This is the way that I want it to be displayed. But I'm gonna put an attribute on this, date time equals. And in here, if you if you look this up, if you look up the time element. The way that the time element works is you can put a date time attribute and the date time attribute is a machine readable version of the date. So for us, we want a date that goes, you know, year, month, day. So we would say uh, 2020 
and November, the 11th month, and the 20th day, let's just say like that. So I'll save this. It's not gonna look any different in the, well, it will if I don't do it correctly. It's not gonna look different in the page, but, um, but the date is embedded in there. So for web crawlers, search engines, various APIs, they can extract dates out of the page more easily when they're trying to look for, uh, look for content in there. This looks like it's bold to me. Um, so if we wanted to, we could say that we want the name. So I could wrap this in a span and I could say um, ID equals author if I wanted to target this. And if I were to specify that the author should be font weight bold, and it's a little bit heavier, not a lot, but a little bit heavier than, uh, let's see here, than the other. How am I doing on sizes? They could probably be smaller. So we could say, um, font size could be, I don't know, 0.7 EM, too small, eight, nine, maybe. Yeah, not bad. Okay. So let's keep going. So what do we have next? We have this line and this line is like a light gray line. And there's a number of ways to do lines. Next week, we're gonna talk about doing borders on elements. So every element can have a line. It could have a line all the way around it, like you make a box, or you could do a line that separates just at the top or just at the bottom. And there's also an HTML element that gets used to do this, um, the horizontal rule, which I have here, this horizontal rule that's going across. The horizontal rule is styled, it's thicker than I want. So if we wanted to, you can style a horizontal rule. I could say that I want my horizontal rule to basically turn off its border and turn on and like set its height to zero and then do my own. So I could say border, put a border across the top that is one pixel high. It's solid as, as opposed to dashed or um, broken or wavy or whatever, just a solid line. And I could say that I want the color to be light gray, something like that. So we could have a more specific color, but I'm just gonna use um, a named color, light gray, to say that I want this to go across and look like this, which looks a little closer to what we're seeing here, like a, a light gray line that goes all the way across. And what's interesting here is that this line doesn't get cut off where the rest of the text is getting cut off. So that's interesting. Ours is working the same way as we look down here. Okay. Um, let's skip this image for a second and let's do this text. So here's what their paragraph looks like. Here's what our paragraph looks like. So if you look at theirs, it's really, really easy to read. It's, first of all, it's large. So the font size is much bigger than mine. You can see that they've opened it up. So they've got nice line height separating each line. It looks like about one and a half or a little more than one and a half um, line height, like if you were doing this in Word and you were saying I want to have 1.5 for my line height. Um, you can see that they've got it left aligned, but they don't have it justified. So the right edge is not sharp. It's it's just flowing at, with the, the content here. Um, they've got this interesting capital letter, letter W, which we could try and recreate. So a bunch of interesting things for us to try and do. Okay, well, let's try Let's try and see what we can do here. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna change the font. So what I'm gonna do is inside of our main element is where all of our paragraphs live. 
So I'm just going to target the, the main element. Whoops, I'm going to say that the main element needs to look like the following. So the main element needs to use a different font family. And the font family that I want to use is EB Garamond, which is the font that we pulled in from Google Fonts. So it's this one right here. So I'm going to try, try setting it to be that font. If we can't use that font, I could list other font. Like I could say I want to use Times New Roman, which is a default that every every um, every browser will have. Or I could say I want to just use whatever the default serif font is. Um, so we save that, and here's how it looks. So it looks better, but it's too small. It's way too small. So let's make it bigger. Let's say that the font size is, okay, so if we said it's 1EM, it's gonna look like that. So that's the base, uh, the base size. Let's, let's go up from that, 1.2. Well, let's do 2EM just to show you like a lot bigger. So that is probably too big. Yeah, that's too big. So it's something in between one and two. So 1.5, too big. Yep. Yeah. So probably it's, let's do half again. So maybe one, two. One, two. That looks good. That looks pretty close. So 1.2, but everything's too tight, so let's open it up. So let's say that we want to set the line height to be equal to, say, a little more than one and a half, say 1.6. And everything just jumps down a little bit. So if we go back here, if we look at this, let's see, let's try and, I can't quite get it all on the page, let's just look at this. So I look at this and Looks like that. It might even be a bit, it might even be too small. Maybe it's 1.3. That might be closer. But you'll, you know, you'll be amazed when you start looking at how large the font size is on many, many websites. Like you would think if you're making a, if you're writing a paper that you're gonna hand in, you would do a 12 point font, but then when you start looking at what people actually do on the web, nobody wants to read a 12 point font. Like if I made this uh, 12 point, it's too small. Like you could read it, but it's, it's not what you want on the web. On the web, you're sitting back. There's, you know, it, it, the web is a, is a, a lean back experience. You're, you're not right into a book. You're you're looking at it on a monitor. You're looking at it on a phone. You're looking at it on some kind of a device where you've got distance. So you need it to be larger. So we'll say we want that to be 1.3. There's, how many words have they got? Let's see here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So about nine, like roughly nine words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like we're we're over by about two or three words. So I would say that we need to further limit this main. So let's say that the max width of this should be like, what did we say above here? We said this was 600. Um, I think we, I think this could be wider. If we make this up here, this could probably be 700, but this down here could be, um, like 550 maybe. And we're pushing just this in. So if you look here, if I inspect this, you can see that what's happening is my paragraph element is inside of main and main is Main is basically being cut shorter, but the other content can go a bit wider, which is I think what they're doing too. So their title goes a little bit wider. They've actually got more space on the left-hand side. So that's actually something we could do. They're kicking it in to, to the, from the left-hand side even more. So they have quite a bit of space here, but then there's even more space here. So that's actually something we could do. Um, let's think about this. If I, 
let's let's put a margin in here and I'll say on the top and bottom on the top and bottom I want to have like a bit of a margin say 20 pixels but on the left and the right on the left and the right hand sides I want to do something bigger like say 50 pixels so that ends up looking like this where this is in but then this is in even more and it's cut off. And so this, this is looking better. We could probably even go narrower. Like if you look at, they, they have theirs. I'm just trying to figure out how much different it is. It's pretty close. I don't know, we could make this like 500. I think that's gonna be too narrow. Oh, maybe that's, maybe 500 is about right. It's amazing, you don't have many words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so, you know, eight, nine, ten words per line going down. That's how ours looks right now. So, interesting, yeah, that's coming along. Now this, we could, we could do this. Do you like the look of this? This is a really common thing. Like, I think it's a holdover from print from magazines, uh, newspapers, they do a lot of it. The, it's called a it's called a drop cap. And if you like if you go and you look up CSS drop cap, you'll find lots of websites that'll show you how to do this, like this one here, for example. This is a great website, CSS Tricks, if you're looking for places to to find. Pay pay special attention when you're going to sites how recently it's been updated because a lot of things in CSS, there was a way that you did it in 2005 and there's a way that you can do it in 2015 or a way that you can do it in 2020 and browsers keep updating in the ways of doing this. So he talks about a number of different ways to do this. And um, so he's saying, if you wanna do this in a cross browser way, take your first letter and wrap it in a span. So we could do that we could go to our very first L and we could add a span. And remember, we, we, we use these spans and divs in order to target something very specifically with styles. So I wanna say ID is equal to first, he does it with a class. It, we could do either here. Um, the advantage of doing it as a class would mean that I could do it in more than one place. Like if I had multiple places where I wanted to do this, so probably doing it as a class is a good idea. So we'll say first, character and put the span on the other side of the L like so and we'll save this and it's not going to look any different right now like you can't see the span but the span is there uh, it exists in the DOM and then what we're going to need to do is we can use his effect we could say the first uh, character what did I call it first letter or first character first let's call it first letter First letter so let's do a couple of things let's set the font size to be large so make it big let's set the line height also to be big and let's push it down at the top, padding on the top, four pixels. Again, we're gonna talk about padding and margin and everything more next week, so don't worry too much about it right now. And padding on the right, push it away from the content on the other side of it. Let's make that eight pixels. And then if we want, you'll notice that he's got his sort of dropping down and then it's floating to the left of this other content. So he does that with a float left. So we could do the same thing. We could say, let's float, float this left like so. And you can see that it now floats to the left of, of the other content. And you can see, so like this padding here, if I made this zero, you'd see, see how everything's coming in really tight to this L. So this first letter here, if you wanna if you wanna push those things over, you're gonna say, I wanna put a little extra space, some extra padding on the right-hand side of that, push it over. You might say, oh, that's too much, let's do six. You can play with it and figure out what, what looks good for you. So we've got a very similar effect 
If I make this a W, it might be easier to see how close it is. So we make it a, make ours a W. Yeah. So our W our font is different than um, than this font, but not by a lot. Okay. So let's go back to an L. Okay, that's looking really good. So what else can we do here? Um, how about this image? So they've got a really nice image and then underneath the image, they've got a caption and then they have a, like a link um, for a source where this, where it came from. So let, let, let's do something similar ourselves. So I was looking for an image that was, that I could use because I can't just take an image like this. Like this image is copyright. You can't go on the web and see an image and say, hey, this image is perfect. I'm just gonna take this image off of somebody else's web page and I'm gonna use it on my own. So what you can do is there's lots of places that have images that are licensed for reuse. One of my favorite sites, uh, Canadian site actually, is Unsplash. And Unsplash allows you to look for, like I was looking for like rock climbing, images and trying to find an image that I could use today just to put in here. And if you want, when you're looking for an image, you could say, I only, I really need an image that's landscape. And I really need an image that has, you know, one of these colors in it. Like I need something with uh, this color or, you know, this color or whatever. Let's get rid of this. I'll do any color. And the first one that comes up is really good. So this, I thought this was a good image and it's close enough to what we were just trying to do. So with Unsplash, you can download and you can use these images to do whatever you want. You can use them in your designs. They're beautiful photography, um, but it's good to give credit back to the person who's done it. So, you know, they've put up their hard work and they've shared it. And if you wanna, if you wanna make use of it, you can, but Unsplash encourages you to give a link back so that people can, can find the photographer who made it. So when you download this, you wanna be careful the original is massive. If I download this, I don't know how many megs it would be, but it would be really, really large. So I'm gonna download the small version because if you think about, like look at how much space I need it to take up. I don't need it to occupy a lot of space, right? So I just wanna stick it in this available space right here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna download the small version of it. And I've already got um, a version of this downloaded on mine. So let's, let's put it in. So the simplest way to put this image into our page would be to drop in um, an image element. So let's just do that here. Inside of our main, I'm gonna drop in an image element to this image. And it looks like that. So, Knowing what we know about um, ways of including images, one thing we want to do is we want to put this extra text at the bottom. So that text at the bottom to me looks like this is a figure and that's the caption on a figure. So we could actually make, we could improve this a little bit. We could say, let's wrap this in a figure. And Inside of our figure, let's put a caption underneath the image. Fig caption, and the fig caption can be, I'm just gonna do some more um, text, a couple of sentences of lorem ipsum. Okay, so that's way too much. Let's do, um, that's probably good. So we got a bunch of text here. Now let's make our text look like the text in the image. So they have their text italicized. So we need to do the same. So what we should do is we should say that our fig caption is going to be 
um, we'll set the we'll set the style for this to be italics. So we'll say that the font style is italic, and we're gonna have to play with the font size because this this font size is too big. So let's do a font size that's a little smaller than our baseline size. We'll do, whoops, not, not eight, but 0.8 EM. That's looking better. And you also notice that this text is a little bit closer together. Like the line height isn't 1.6. So let's say that our line height is equal to like, I don't know, 1.2 maybe. like so. So that looks pretty good. That looks pretty similar to what's here. And we need to do this little call out here at the end. So for the call out, um, what I wanna do is I wanna put a, the same sort of thing that they've done. I wanna, I wanna add into my Figure caption, I've got a, a thing that I've copied and pasted from uh, Unsplash. I have a link to the website of the photographer as well as their name. And I can put this in a span that says, you know, this is this is a credit block and I'm crediting this person with a link to their material so that if anyone likes it, they could find this person's website and they'd be able to, to work with it. So if I save this, ours looks like this. So we get the, the default styling of a link, which isn't what we want. So we need to we need to fix we need to fix the way that that works. So we've wrapped it in a credit so we can make some changes to the way that the credit class works. So what can we do? We can make the color gray because theirs is gray. We could change the font family to be one of our sans serif fonts, so we could we could reuse uh, this font that we've been working with previously, so let's do that. Change the font family. Um, I noticed that they don't use italics. So everything else is italicized, but this one is not italicized. So instead of font style, being italic, we want to go back to normal. So make it make it back the way that it was before. And they've got their font size pretty small. So let's drop ours um, down. We're using 0.8 for the rest of the text. Let's try 0.7 for this text here. Like so. This might be what if I make this 0.8? Actually, that doesn't look too bad. That might be okay. Now, the only thing I don't like is I don't like how the link is blue. So we need to specify, remember how we're building this. We have a span with the credit class. And then inside that we have this anchor, a href equals. So we need to target this a inside of dot credit. So what we can do is we can say inside of a credit, there is an anchor and we want to make some changes to the way that, that this thing looks. So for example, we can say, how do we get rid of the underline? We say text decoration is going to be none, like that. Text decoration is none, and let's make the color also equal to gray, just like we're doing for the rest of the text. So now you can see this is a link, but you can't tell it's a link unless you hover over it. So we could actually put the underline back when you hover over it by saying dot credit A, and then we have to use that pseudo selector. So we have to say when the user hovers over this, I wanna set the text decoration back to underline. So now if I go here and I put my cursor over it, it goes like this. We could, you know, we could do other things. We could change the color, we could do all sorts of things. So this text here, if I hover over this, 
we're using the gray color and um, whoops that's not what I want you can see that Chrome when I hover over this it's giving me a warning so at the very bottom there it says that my contrast is not very good 3.95 and you can probably see it like you can see how much easier this L is to see versus this text here. So when you're when you're putting color, when you're putting text on top of a background, you really have to pay attention to how good is the contrast between the foreground and the background. And it's saying to me, you know what, this this really is um, is not good. Now let me see if I can get let me see if I can get um, we could darken this up. We could go down darker. So it's still gray, but I'm on the wrong element. Sorry, let me get on my fig caption. On dot credit here. So this, what if we did dark gray? That's like, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's gone down 2.35. Um, so we need to play with this because this, this color, whoops, this color is not, not gonna work. So one of the nice things you have in the dev tools is it'll it'll show you when you're in the color picker that your contrast ratio is no good. And if you open up this area, it shows you in order to get a double A rating on this, I need to take this color and I need to move it down here. So that is a color that would have excellent contrast and I can copy this color here and I could use that instead of my dark gray. So I'm going to put it here and I'm going to put it here like so and I'll save that and now my page I'm still using a gray but I have I have a gray that is dark enough that it gives me the it gives me the um, it gives me the contrast that I need okay we're getting close to being finished with this let's do a couple more things so another thing I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you about different image types because right now we're loading uh, on the network. Let's see how big this image is. So we're loading this uh, JPEG. If I refresh this. I'm loading it as a JPEG, but I'm in a browser that actually supports another format. So Google has a new format that they've put out called WebP and it's supported by a lot of different browsers. So when you're whenever you're look when you're doing web development and you want to check if different browsers support different features, you can use this website caniuse.com and you can type in a feature. So for example, can I use WebP? And the WebP format you'll see is supported in all of these different browsers, but it's not supported in some browsers. So for example, Safari on iOS version 13.1 does not support it, but they've talked about supporting it in, in version 14, which is great. It's supported in Firefox, it's supported in Chrome, but it's not supported in IE 11 and so on. So oftentimes what we'll have to do is we'll have to use multiple different formats in order to achieve what we want. So what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to take this format, this WebP format, and I'd like to be able to have a WebP format, which is much smaller than JPEG. And I'd like to also have the JPEG version. So I want to have both of these available to me. So what I'm going to do is you can download tools to convert JPEGs to WebP. And um, that's what I have uh, I've downloaded this file. So let me just show you how you would generate this. So if I drop into my terminal, I have this JPEG. 
Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the CW C Web P, the conversion tool that Google has made available. I'm going to convert this JPEG file and I'm going to output the equivalent Web P file. So it saves that file and I now have two files. I have a JPEG file and I have a WebP file. So what I'm gonna do in my, in my HTML is I'm going to modify my code so that instead of just using an image, I'm gonna offer two possible versions of this file. So I'm going to use a new element type called the picture type. And what the picture element allows you to do is it allows you to specify multiple sources. So what I can do is I can say, this is very similar to what you learned how to do with a video element. When you're doing a video or an audio element, you'll have a source that's uh, an MP4, a source that's an OGG, and you'll have different sources depending on what the browser is able to support. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in a source for my JPEG version of the file. So I'm gonna say, this is the URL to the JPEG version of my file, and the type is image JPEG. And I'm gonna do a second one, which is gonna be source, a source that's going to be for my WebP. And now the browser can choose which one it supports. So this will work in Safari, this will work in older browsers, newer browsers, because what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna have a fallback image. So if the browser doesn't know how to support these newer, if it's an older browser or an older device that doesn't support this switching technique, it's gonna display this image right here. But otherwise, what the browser is gonna do is it's gonna pick between the most appropriate version for showing this image. So I can, reload this and the browser can decide which version of the which version of the file it wants to display when displaying that file. So this is a nice way for you to be able to give uh, to overcome browser compatibility issues when you're trying to load these files um, by providing you know multiple multiple different versions of it that people could use. Okay, so what else? What else should we do here? Is there anything else that I wanted to I wanted to discuss? One thing I don't like is I don't like how this image is hanging over so far to the edge. So if you'll see this picture element, my figure element is here, my picture element, it's the, it's my image element. My image element is going too wide. So one thing I could do, I wonder if I could specify that I want my image element um, to stay contained within its container. So set its max width to be 100% of its parent element, of its parent container. So it's not allowed to extend beyond the width of whatever it's in, like so. So let's see how that works now. So I have a figure. The figure has a whole bunch of extra space around the outside of it, which means that it doesn't line up with the edges of this. Whereas if I look over here, you can see that this is really tight to the edges. So what I need to do is I need to also take my figure um, and I need to get rid of the margins around the sides of it so that this image lines up with the text down here like so and this lines up with the sides like this. That looks good. Now there's one more trick that I'm gonna cover just as we end here. And that is, you'll notice that if you go to this page, if you grab the window and you start dragging the window, you'll see that it 
it changes pretty significantly. Like look at, as I'm dragging, it gets to a certain point and then it snaps. So we call this a break point. So there's a breaking point at which when you get beyond that width, it's gonna change the display and it's gonna look a little bit different. When you are underneath that width, it's gonna give you something else. So we use this in order to do mobile styles of view. So if you're on an iPad or a tablet, if you're on a phone, if you're in landscape mode or portrait mode, we can make the page look quite a bit different depending on how we, how we do this, like this. So one of the things I noticed, for example, is it's putting these social sharing icons in when whenever this happens it's centering all the text and you can also see that as this goes narrower you can see how it starts to fill the whole screen or the whole browser window it the margins change quite a bit so let's see if we can do a little bit of this the trick to doing this when there when we're changing if i open up the dev tools again we can see what the window size is so as i'm dragging this window um, you can see it up in the top right corner, it'll show you what the width of the window is. And it looks like the window changes, um, I don't know, somewhere around a thousand pixels or something like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write what's called a media query. So I'm gonna say that if we are on a screen, as opposed to say a printer, and if the maximum width available to us is, let's, let's do 700 pixels just to begin with, then I have a bunch of extra rules that I'd like to apply. Okay, so one of the rules that I'd like to apply is I'd like to take the header and I would like to align everything inside the header, inside the header as centered. So watch what happens. As I drag this window, when I get down to 700, it snaps. You see that change right there? Stops right there. So there's left aligned, centered. Left aligned, centered, like so, okay? Um, I also wanna tighten up the amount of space that's available. So I wanna reduce the margin down to something small, say 10 pixels. So if I go across like this, but there's still too much extra space that is coming from the body. So the body is adding a lot. So I'm gonna say that I want the body's margin to be zero, let's say. So as I go down, you can see that up at the top here, I have more space available to me. Set them, um, and let's make the width of the body 100% so it fills all the available space. So as I scroll down, that looks good. I also, I have way too much margin on my main. So in addition to playing with the header, I'm gonna set the main elements margin to be small, I don't know, 10 pixels. So when I'm like this, it's big, but as I go down, once I hit 700, it goes like this. And you can see how this is working. Now, do you see how it's not making use of this space over here? That's because I set the maximum width of my header and my main to be 700 pixels wide. But if I'm under 700 pixels, so if the maximum width is 700 pixels or less, then what I wanna do is I wanna take my header and my main, and I wanna set the maximum width to be what? 100% of the available space. 100% of the available room, like so. So now as I'm shrinking this down, you can see that it is floating with the edge of this until it gets to 700. And then at 700, it changes. So if I show you, let me get rid of the dev tools. As you shrink it down, it goes down, 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 and then all of a sudden it snaps. And now it, it becomes, it fills the space. And if I keep shrinking down, it will keep shrinking. You can see how it's, it's forcing everything to be 100% of the width. All of this is centered. 
We go across like this. So that's working very similar to this. So let's get rid of this. Centered, left aligned, once I get out to about here, you can see that it changes. So we're doing all this with a media query that says, when the conditions are such that the maximum width is 700 pixels or whatever we decide to set it to, we want to change some of the rules so that these things apply. So CSS is going to override what we did above in order to make in order to make this work. Okay, so last thing and then we'll we'll pause. This will be the end of it. See these icons here? This is a really common thing that you're going to want to do is putting in some sort of icons for different companies or social media sharing. How do they do this? Well, an easy way for us to do this is to use um, a service like Font Awesome. Let me just close some tabs here. This is Font Awesome, and Font Awesome is exactly that. It is, if I wanted the Facebook icon, for example, I can get the Facebook icon as part of a web font, or if I wanted to get the Twitter icon, or if I wanted um, like a mail, like an envelope, I can get all of these different icons. And so what Font Awesome does is it ships you the library as a CSS style sheet, and then it implements classes that you can use. So I'll show you how you use this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna include the font awesome style sheet in my HTML. And instead of doing it as an import, I'm going to do it up at the top. I'm going to put it in above my style sheet that I am including. So now I have two style sheets. I have a style sheet for font awesome, and this is to, uh, this is going to pull in all of their styles. And then I have my own styles here. And the way that this works, so if I wanted to use this envelope icon, for example, what you have to do is you have to put in an element that defines two classes. You use the font awesome class and then the particular um, element that you want, FA envelope. If I was doing Twitter, it would be the Twitter icon or whatever. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put um, after the author, I'm going to put in a div and I'm going to call this uh, social. These are my social icons. So for sharing. And I'm just going to copy here. I'll copy this envelope. If I click on it, it'll copy it and I can paste it right here. And the, this will only work if these classes are defined, but they're going to be defined because we've just loaded this style sheet right here. So that style sheet gets loaded. The style sheet defines these classes, and when I run it, let's I'll show you what it looks like. So you see that we now have a little envelope here. Okay, so let's do the same thing. Let's for font awesome. Let's go. Let's get the Twitter icon, and I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this, and I'm gonna paste this like so, and let's do the same for Facebook. Copy this, paste it here. Whoops, not there, there. Save that. So now I have these three icons. Now, if you look at what happens here, notice how the icons aren't here. The icons don't seem to be here until you go small, until you go narrow. So how am I gonna make my code do that? I need to make this div, this social div, not be there unless we are in the narrow uh, the narrow screen size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my CSS and up at the top I'm going to say that my social div I want to set its display type to be none. So I don't want it to be visible. It, don't put anything there. So if I save this right now and we go back you'll see that it's not there. However, if we are inside of this media query, if we're inside of a compressed amount of space, we're less than 700 pixels, 
Then what I want to do is I want my social icons to be display block. I want that div to be displayed as a block element, or I want the div to be displayed not at all, none. So I'm going to save this, and you can see that the icons are here, like so. Um, let's... Let's put in some extra space on the side. So I'm going to I'm going to basically what I want to do is I want to make sure that there's extra space after all of these i elements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh not here. Yeah, I'll say social and then i. So all of the i elements that are inside social, I want to add padding. I want to put say 20 pixels on the top and bottom and 25 pixels left and right. And that's what it looks like. So if you look back here, you can see we have these three. And then if you look here, I have these three. If I scroll over, once I hit my breakpoint, it vanishes. But now it's there, now it's gone. Just like that, okay? So that was a lot. I will post this code so that you can try this yourself. And we didn't do anything really complicated here today. We used all the things from the notes this week, setting the font sizes, but we did pull in fonts from other third parties, Google Web Fonts and so on. We played with colors, we played with um, widths, we centered things. Uh, we used lots and lots of basic CSS, but the end result is really beautiful. So we end up with uh, a page that looks like, you know, the same sort of thing that, that the, the New Yorker is using when they publish their articles. Really high quality. It took us, we did it in an hour, but once you were doing this, if you weren't narrating the whole thing, you could do it a lot quicker. So not too bad, not too bad. Uh, as I say, I'll post it and you can play with it. I would encourage you, try making this on your own too. See, see if you could do this. Anyway, go back through the notes, make sure you're comfortable with all these concepts and let me know if you have anything that you're struggling with or not understanding of what we've done.